Hello, this is Dennis Dalton, the Flight Safety Officer at the Rocky Mountain Flight Training Center at Peterson Air Force Base. This is the safety meeting presentation for February 23rd, 2021. Aircraft pre-flight examined. Is every pre-flight the same? Well, everyone reads the checklist. From our training days, we remember the flight instructor's explanation on every aspect of the aircraft. Every checkout in a different aircraft includes a similar review of basic components and any new items particular to this make and model. But are there any circumstances where certain items on the checklist should receive extra scrutiny? The answer is yes. A return to service after maintenance downtime should involve extra scrutiny of any elements that could have been changed during service. This would include cowling and inspection cover attachments, elevator, aileron, and rudder control function, and all attached movable surfaces. The service or maintenance cycles of club aircraft are more frequent than privately owned aircraft, and this is designed for increased safety. Let's first review the number of inspections required. From the Aero Club SOPs, there are 25 and 50 hour inspections. 25 hour and 50 hour inspections listed here, right from the AFMAN book 6.3.1. FTC Aero Club aircraft will have 25 hour Continental engines, T-41s, and 50 hour inspections, which these airplanes have. If all change, oil change is not required, the inspection may be performed on the ramp. 25 and 50 hour inspections are due within the window of five hours prior to or five hours after due time, which means you can re overfly uh, the 25 or 50 hour window uh, not to exceed five hours. 100 hour inspections will not deliberately be overflown. Any flights having airworthiness directives due will have those items complied with prior to anticipating overflight. ADs cannot be overflown. Cross countries will be planned to return at least two hours prior to the 100 hour inspection time due. Yes, these Continental engines have no oil filters, as you know, and therefore have more frequent oil change requirements, hence the 25 and 50 hour requirements. So there are quite a few uh, times when these airplanes are in a maintenance cycle. And therefore it is uh, important to know when those are and whether you're the first person flying that aircraft uh, right after that maintenance cycle so that you are clear about what's been done to the aircraft so that you can look at it. Clearly the safety of the aircraft is everyone's responsibility from the operator, which is the Aero Club, to the pilot in command, which is you. Here's a responsibility here in part 91, 1413, for aircraft maintained in accordance with continuous airworthiness maintenance program, such as the Aero Club, each program manager, which is the Aero Club, is responsible for maintaining the airworthiness of the program aircraft, including airframes, aircraft engines, propellers, rotors, appliances, and parts. We all know from our training that the PIC is the final authority responsible for the flight, responsibility and authority of the pilot in command. From the FAR's 91.3, the pilot in command of an aircraft is directly responsible for and the final authority as to the operation of that aircraft. So how would we know what has been done to the aircraft after any given maintenance downtime? Well, the logbooks would be the first place to look. Uh, when in doubt, you would ask the instructor or talk to Bob or Neil. Uh, remember, the flight is your responsibility. The aircraft maintenance logs are available for you to look at before you fly. Remember, you must get permission as outlined in this SOP excerpt. Maintenance records. All aircraft maintenance records are legally secure documents, according to the FARs. 
when a student is preparing for an FAA check ride, which may have been the last time you actually looked at these, or wants to review the records, the manager or chief instructor, or in this case also the maintenance personnel such as Neil, must be notified in advance. Maintenance records are not permitted outside of the office building. They are to be kept under the control of the chief of maintenance and the manager. They will not be left in the ground school room or in any other area. And as you know, these are kept in uh, the maintenance room in uh, where Neil keeps his office in a locked metal cabinet. Remember in previous safety briefs, it was pointed out that a good pilot treats every flight as a check ride. This means as if an examiner was present during your flight. You would want to have all the logbooks in order and know the condition of every item. While our club maintenance is excellent, it is still very important to double check items that have been replaced or removed. Even the club SOPs outline FCFs, which are functional test flights, after maintenance of the aircraft or power plant as deemed appropriate by the club manager, chief pilot, and the mechanic. Uh, a new engine is a primary example of a reason for an FCF flight. As well as the complexity of the various components being replaced, the engine requires a specific break-in procedure. Um, let's look at the functional check flights from the SOPs. All FTC Aero Club FCFs are accomplished by the chief instructor or another instructor as designated by the manager. Crew members may include manager, a mechanic, or other individuals designated by the manager as required for the mission. Passengers and students are not authorized on board an aircraft during an FCF. All FCFs will be performed during daylight hours and VFR weather conditions. The route of flight and expected maneuvers are established prior to the flight and noted on the FTC Aero Club flight plan. FTC Aero Club Form 1, a brief written report of the FCF is added to the aircraft squawk sheet to be retained in the aircraft's files. This report will include purpose of flight, maneuvers accomplished, any unusual characteristics or problems, statement of airworthiness, acceptance of aircraft. Just because there is not an FCF scheduled for a flight that comes out after maintenance, you should treat it as such and scrutinize any items that you feel were worked on for proper function at all times. Everyone is familiar with the squawk sheet in each aircraft binder. It's mentioned in the SOPs. That is every pilot's responsibility to be vigilant and report any discrepancies in equipment function or safety concerns. While this is quite a uh, obvious, um, has some obvious discrepancies, it's noted here in the SOPs that the notification of maintenance discrepancies, and I have it in bold type here, Aero Club members and staff will notify the manager or chief instructor of any aircraft maintenance requirements. If the manager or chief instructor cannot be contacted, the maintenance staff can be notified by leaving a message on the FTC Aero Club answering machine. Air Force Form 781 will have all discrepancies entered. You know, pilots as a rule are not certified A&P mechanics, but with a familiarity with maintenance procedures and high wear items that frequently need attention are worth looking at here. Let's examine a couple of the items from the printed T41 CD checklist that involve details not apparent in the check, uh, checklist wording. You know, a high level of understanding and familiarity with aircraft you are flying can greatly reduce stress and the risk factor of the flight for you and your passengers. Uh, this is one excerpt from the checklist and right out interior inspect exterior inspection. Uh, during the exterior inspection, note the condition of the aircraft surfaces, antennas, and security of all access panels, as we had mentioned earlier. In addition, control surfaces should be checked for clearance and security of attachment and actuator bolts, including hinges, rollers, slides, actuator cables, and counterweights. 
Well, all aircraft control surfaces are attached with some form of locking attachment mechanism to prevent it from coming loose. And do you know what to look for? The picture on the left here shows a properly wired safety wire installation to hold fasteners in a clockwise rotation to keep them tight. See how this one is pulling this way? This one's pulling this way. So they're both in clockwise to keep them tight. The photo on the right shows safety wire improperly attached that has no clockwise tension on the bolt and is a safety concern. The control surface attachment uh, bolts and nuts have many different locking systems, not pictured here. One common type of nut is called a nylock, which is the nut con which contains a nylon plastic liner inside the threads to lock the nut. Uh, for that reason, these are not to be reused. They do not need a safety wire. Look closely at the type of nut being used. Does it have a hole? like these do, or, which, or a slot, which is referred to as a castle nut. If so, it should have a safety wire. In addition, aileron hinges, rudder, elevator, and trim tab hinges have hinge pins fastened by procedures as simple as being bent over at each end and sometimes can break off. Uh, those are also should be looked at for that reason. Uh, the walk around checklist continues with as you walk around to the back and come around to the right main wheel inspection. Is the tire and hub cap secure? What does that mean? And here is the excerpt out of the checklist, checking for inflation cuts and blisters and that the hub cap is secure. Well, focus on the main wheel in this picture. Notice how the, the large nut in the middle right here of the tire rim. The left main wheel behind this picture, which is over here, clearly shows the puck or brake caliper right here of the left main wheel. So we'll be talking about those two items. The drawing on the right is a typical exploded view or schematic of the seals bearings two-piece tire rim and the brake rotor. So these are sets of seals here, here is the bearing for the outside. This would be the outside of the wheel. This is the two halves of the rim, which go together with bolts. And here's a pic there's one bolt up here. Uh, you'll notice in this picture here, if I can get back, no, nope, can't go back. Uh, here's the bearing on the inside, and then you have spacers, seals right here. So there is no hub cap on these rims, as you noted in the previous picture, but a threaded axle with a large castle nut and cotter pin that holds the two-piece rim, parts one and three, which are these two, on the axle. The axle is not shown, which actually runs through this whole uh, arrangement here. And generally, it'll go back through here. Or these are extra pieces or separate pieces that might fit a different application. Um, this nut that's on here also puts proper tension on the two cone-shaped bearings. These bearings here are not straight across, but actually in the shape of a cone. So as they tighten, as you tighten the nut, they, they, uh, attention is applied to them. There should be a little wiggle in the tire on the axle when installed properly. The bearings are held snug, but not too tight into the their holder, which is called a race. And that tightness is referred to as preload. That is why there's a cotter pin in the nut to hold the, uh, because it, it's not actually tight. Uh, another thing from the checklist is brake assembly. It says check the brake pucks for thickness, minimum 330 seconds of an inch and brake lines for security and leakage. Uh, well, let's talk about the puck first. I referred to that in the picture, uh, the previous picture, and the puck refers to the caliper which holds the pads. 
The image on the left is a picture of one brake pad. Their thickness can be determined by looking down from the top of the puck, which holds the brake pads. Its thickness when new is two and a half times the thickness described as minimum. Uh, the black holes in the picture are the rivets holding the pad on the metal plate. If wear continues undetected and reaches these rivets, scoring and damage is done to the rotor on which the caliper rests and the pads press up against to stop the aircraft. The pads wear out frequently and require vigilance to prevent rotor damage. Grooves in the rotors are determined visually and by feel. Smooth grooves, which means they have rounded edges, are from excessive heat wear and are fairly common, especially in rental aircraft. Sharp gouges are done from uh, wearing the brake pads down too far and reaching the rivets, which will scratch the rotor. Um, if they go down to that far, you may notice at that time some wetness around there, which would be the seals, the hydraulic seals, which press these brake pads onto the rotor, and they're probably leaking. Um, the hydraulic seals uh, really have a very small travel inside the puck, and so once they get out of their normal operating range, they will tend to leak. Also, if the pads are that old and they've worn down that far, more than likely the seals are, are stiff and would leak also. Uh, another thing to point out here is that the hydraulic brake lines are routed very near the strut step, and frequently the lines are damaged from entry and exit of the aircraft um, by foot traffic. And so those also require extra scrutiny. You know, flying is a lifelong learning experience. Try to learn something new at every pre-flight. Well, this concludes the written uh, safety briefing and the YouTube of this briefing also. So this is available on myrockymountainflight.com safety. So thanks for listening and I'll see you next month.